creative mind. The Lowell Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council presents Man the Creator, essay number one in the National Association of Educational Broadcasters series, The Creative Mind. Produced by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the Educational Television and Radio Center. These conversations explore the creative process as it pertains to the American artist and scientist in the 20th century. Guests for this program, Louis Finkelstein, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Milton C. Nam. And here is our host and commentator for the creative mind, Lyman Bryson. In this series, we're going to explore a mystery. When we get through it, it will still be a mystery. It's been a mystery for a long time. And it ought to be easy to understand why it's a mystery, since artists and creative thinkers in science, everyone who has an inventive mind, uses a special form for the expression of his ideas. If he could explain in words what it is that he tries to do, in stone if he's an architect, in sound if he's a musician, in words if he's a poet or a novelist, if he could do that in words... He wouldn't have to use his art. He wouldn't have to build buildings or write music or do dancing. He'd just tell us about it. Even a novelist would tell us the kind of novel he was going to write instead of writing the novel. And of course, they can't do that because the essential thing about a creative personality is that there is some form of expression which gives him special access to our imagination, gives him a special power over us, and it's only that form. Well, then one might say, why talk to artists at all? Why talk to them about their art? There are two answers to this question. One is that if they talk about their art, they might rouse interest in some of us in things that we otherwise might pass over or think not deserving of our attention. Talking to an artist about his work sometimes opens up doors which otherwise stay closed. But there's another thing, too, about these people, these creative artists and scientists, and that is that if they can describe to us the conditions under which they work, uh, the things that they think are necessary to make them productive, the things that um, seem to smooth their path toward uh, great achievement, if they can tell us about these things, we might create in our culture, in our civilization, conditions that would produce uh, more, uh, at least in the way of result, uh, given the potentialities which we have probably as well as any other nation. It might help us to salvage some of the gifted children. It's surprising and a little disheartening to those who watch the growth of children to see how often in their younger years, when they're, when they're quite young and life is fresh to them, how they are inventive, imaginative, and then we educate them, as we say. We train them, we bring them into contact with the civilization in which they have to live, and somehow or other the creativeness seems to dry up. What's the reason for this? Is it because we don't educate them properly, that we don't reward them with what we should give them, that we don't encourage them in the right way? Perhaps if we know more about how inventive minds in the arts and the sciences work, we might know better how to have more of them and be better staffed with geniuses uh, in a civilization like ours where we have great need of inventiveness and imagination. In order to begin this series... On the broadest possible base, we decided to discuss with uh, three philosophers uh, the uh, socket uh, of experience in which one might expect to find uh, creativeness. What kind of life gives a man uh, creativeness? We asked uh, uh, Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr, the Reverend Reinhold Niebuhr, who is professor of theology at Union Theological Seminary, a famous theologian and writer on political subjects, uh, Rabbi Louis Finkelstein, who is Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and Professor Milton Naum of Bryn Mawr. We ask these men, not as uh, creative thinkers, although uh, they are creative in their own lines, but as scholars, as men who have spent their lives studying the way in which uh, a great civilization is built and studying the ideals out of which artists and scholars uh, and uh, scientists uh, have made the things uh, by which we live and which we strive for. Because, after all, the artist especially serves the ideals of his time. He helps to create them. He certainly criticizes them, but he serves them. And what we wanted to do in talking with uh, 
uh, with Dr. Niebuhr and uh, uh, Rabbi Finkelstein and uh, Professor Naum was to find out if we could some of those basic ideas uh, which philosophers have placed as the circumstance for creativeness. I began by uh, raising the question with uh, Professor Niebuhr as to whether or not it wouldn't be useful to examine historically the idea of freedom that makes creative action possible. Well, couldn't one say that uh, the creative impulse in man is rooted in his freedom? His freedom has at least two dimensions. It, it is the freedom of the, the capacity for making general concepts, as Aristotle said, to transcend the, the particularities of nature by conceptual images. That, but this is only one part of the freedom, the mathematical, logical, rational part of the freedom. But man is a self, he's an individual, uh, and he has, uh, this is the second dimension, he has a unique freedom to transcend himself and to transcend his mind, if you will. And uh, out of this dimension of freedom, or let us say broadly speaking, there comes art and religion rather than science and philosophy. I'm wondering what kind of creation we're talking about at this moment. If we're talking about the creation of the in specific fields like art, science, and philosophy. And government. And government. Hmm. And economics and so on. Uh, that, of course, is one matter. I, uh, my mind runs more on uh, the creativeness which is common to all human beings. Uh, which is the creation of a good life. Now, I imagine that that is as old as the human race itself. And uh, that comes out of uh, a sense of something beyond man. In other words, a sense of service. And of all people, <coughs> Bertrand Russell was the one who remarked about this. He said the medievalists, like Michelangelo, were able to create enduringly because they believed in God. Uh, Bertrand Russell uh, uh, obviously does not suggest that we go back to belief in God, but he really has no other suggestion to make. Isn't he hoping, I've always felt this, to find some kind of self-transcendence which would not be what he calls a belief in God, but would still be a transcendence yes. of self, this second dimension that Mr. Niebuhr well, is talking couldn't about? Couldn't you say that in as far as a self transcendent self is bound to have to sense a system of values beyond its interests, more inclusive than its interests. This is the root of morality and religion. But harmonious with its interests, basically. Well, he knows. Knows. yes, but it seems to me he really knows. it seems to me really this is a this is the nerve of the question. That on the one side you've got a theory of a rational theory of choice, which is good Greek philosophy. On the other side you've got a theory of free originality, which is, I think, quite modern. It comes, I think, directly out of the Christian and Hebraic tradition. And I think it comes directly out of the notion that God is completely unconditioned and man is created in his image and God has free, a uh, man has free will. The Greek had no conception of free will. They had a conception of freedom of choice, which means completely conditioned freedom. And I think that these things that come out in art are extremely important for our own civilization precisely because uh, the problems in ethics, politics, and so on have been really uh, done to death. They, they, they're no longer alive. But if you see that freedom is a part of the general problem of originality in art, I think there are new ways of dealing with it. I think it suggests different ways of creativity. I think it energizes people's wills. I think it hasn't been, it hasn't become so dogmatic and hidebound. Then simply because the, the, the language of art uh, is different and can be used in this way. And as far as the notion of transcendence is concerned, it seems to me that what you've really got is, a, is an opposition of a theory of free choice and originality. And I think that it gives rise to two quite different values. The first one, uh, free choice, I think makes our world an intelligible world insofar as it can. It leads to kind of perfection. But originality leads to the value of novelty and individuality, and this is what we're always after. We want these two things. We want, we want to know where we are, so we can set up a, a place where we choose rationally, but we want to be individuals and we want to go beyond that. And if this is so, we're, well, our problem in creativity is the problem of how we can be people with, free, with good wills and free wills and at the same time intelligible people who know the conditions under which I, we live. I think that's an excellent distinction. The, uh, 
the rational uh, dimension of freedom, uh, giving us the uh, structures yes. of existence. We transcend our own situation by knowing the structures. And then there is this additional freedom, which uh, you say uh, provides for originality, which goes beyond. Uh, and I think you're quite right in saying this is basically the distinction between the Hellenic and the Hebraic, with the exception of Socrates, who doesn't quite fit into well, the... It seems to me that the, the theory of God as a creator and of man in the image of God is really the illustration of free will. And the notion of a cosmic maker, an artisan, or an art of someone who works in matter, in matter which he doesn't create, and after ideas which he does create, is a notion of a condition. Well, well, suppose we try to get... Suppose we try to get to the moral basis of creation, mm -hmm. which is what I'm trying to work through, that creation comes out of a certain moral mm -hmm. discipline. Mm -hmm. And it's not possible <clears throat> in a world in which that moral discipline is lacking. Mm -hmm. Now, this moral discipline uh, may result from a transcendent vision, but isn't it also possible that a transcendent vision can only come to people who are morally disciplined? And one of the reasons that we have so little great creation nowadays is that there is no transcendent vision, and there is no transcendent vision because everyone is afraid that if he got it, he would have to change his whole way of life and his whole commitment. So that, uh, in a way, we are in a sort of vicious circle here. Uh, we are avoiding the discipline uh, because it's very hard. That prevents us from having a transcendent vision, and therefore trans prevents us from being transcendently creative, as we could be, uh, take America as individuals or America as a nation, recoils from the cost of what creation might, uh, might, uh, might involve. Now, I, I would say that what Professor Nam has said in two different contexts goes at the heart of the creativity of our Western civilization. I think it was providential that our Western civilization had both the rational and the existential, if you will, the um, uh, conception of the, of the structures which we must obey, the structures of reality, and the ultimate vision of uh, transcendent good. These always combine. Uh, so that um, they, we have the two bases of freedom and the two bases of creativity in the Greek and in the Hebraic uh, Wouldn't roots of our culture. May I say something here? It seems to me that Mr. Finkelstein suggested a way in which they combine uh, dynamically, Mr. Niebuhr. His paradox, if I misunderstood him, that it's only when you have fitted yourself into a set of uh, disciplinary morals that you can prophetically transcend them and create the new morals, that you have to be a part of a system before you can break it up. Now, this, if it's true in relation to the prophets and the good life, I would say is curiously exemplified in the life of practically all great artists who become very, very expert in the techniques of their trade before they transcend the techniques of their predecessors. Mm -hmm. Nearly all the great artists were great technicians. They didn't discard. They learned and transcended the techniques of their predecessors. And this seems to me to be a parallel of great interest. Uh, wouldn't you say, uh, Mr. Bryson, that one of the uh, difficulties of the modern artist, I don't know much about art, but my impression is that, is that he's so terribly eager to be original that he, uh, uh, that he doesn't even take the trouble to know what has been done before and therefore can't, can't achieve originality because he refuses to try to learn uh, or to master the skills that have already been developed. Well, let me quote a... a a man of very great knowledge in art, who was a friend of a number of us, who died not very many weeks ago, Francis Taylor, who one time when I was walking with him through the Metropolitan, when he was director of it, uh, was talking about Picasso. And he said, people think that Picasso just uh, sort of wandered freely through the methods. He knew everybody's methods so well that he could caricature practically every great technique there ever was. And his originality lay... Uh, not, not as a matter of cause and effect, but was founded upon mm. a miraculous mm. control of techniques of every kind. Well, I would, Sorry. I Sorry. would agree with uh, Finkelstein's general emphasis upon the vision, uh, the tradition, the discipline, which is the basis of the creativity of the moment. But I, 
question here is pessimism about modern culture. I know that some of modern culture uh, runs into the sand because it has an, enough sense of tradition, discipline, vision. Nevertheless, uh, one has to recognize that what people call modern secularism is partly, partly a protest against false religious visions. We say that what we want is what God wants and what's God's will. So I'm inclined to regard modern secularism not as the root of all evil, but as one of the prophetic byproducts of a culture, both Greek and Hebraic, that is always uh, uh, in tension between the historical facts and the ultimate. Now, uh, what, what do we say, what do we have to say about the psychology of creativity, uh, the, about the, the, uh, the kind of personality that we would try to develop among our, our raw materials in order that they could do these things. Couldn't you say that you can't guarantee originality? All you can guarantee is that there be a discipline in the great traditions of art, of science, of religion, that there be a discipline there so that the originality would, would not be merely capricious. Then, after the discipline has been established, then you've got to trust to the um, creativities of the human spirit. There will be an original person come up here, an artist, scientist, and so forth, but you can't guarantee that. You can guarantee uh, the ground, uh, the soil, out of which a, a, a real originality may emerge rather than capricious uh, individuality. A solid basis that can be transcended. But we're told no. by all kinds of critics, many of them picky, <laughs> of course, that this just leads to a kind of Byzantine uh, static society, that you have so much discipline you can't have any originality. I would agree with you, but what do you say to a person? Well, I think one of the things you say to him is that nobody can be can make something or in a state or in a community or in art or in ethics or anything else unless that making is not only intelligible, but it's also original. I mean, these things are not mutually exclusive except in their, in their uh, limits. And so that if a man makes a shoe or if he makes a family or anything of the sort... Or a symphony. Or a symphony, uh, it depends upon where in the line between these two extremes he falls. And if you, I should agree, if you can teach him the technique of, that is rational and intelligible, then you've offered him the tools by which he can become original. He may not have the capacities, but he's never completely intelligent, or intelligent, he never produces anything completely intelligible, he never produces anything completely original. He always does something in which his individuality enters in, so that then you have to work on that basis. Now, in our time, uh, the, the whole family structure, the whole community structure, makes against the emergence of creative minds of truly creative minds, uh, because a young person is brought under the greatest possible pressures to produce quickly. We're really giving him very little with which to fight the enormous pressures, far greater than any time before, which are brought to bear upon him in our time, and smother creativeness. And one of the interesting things to me is that when you think that in 1787, Three million Americans or three and a half million Americans were able to produce the Constitutional Convention. I don't think 170 million Americans could produce the Constitutional Convention today to deal with the problems which confront us. That kind of wisdom, kind of ability to create a lasting document, to deal with the compromises that have to be produced, to really to contribute a great document to the world, well, I don't see it. Now, uh, now that, that, uh, uh, I think that perhaps is the, the worst indictment of us, that as a nation we are not creative. And you're rejecting all ideas that it's biological or something like that. It lies in the nature of our society that the potential talents of this order do not emerge and operate. Let's put it like this. Uh, our, interest in, our interest in annual automobile models is symbolic of that contemporaneousness and that and that passion for comforts, gadgets, and so forth that makes for the Bulgarian. And now we're not talking about Western culture in general. Finkelstein is talking about the American culture, and I think he's quite right. As an extreme example of Western culture, perhaps. Uh, Mr. Price, let me raise a question here which went through my mind as we're talking. I myself limited uh, the discussion to a very, to a very narrow 
uh, area, namely America, as Mr. Neal pointed out. But as uh, he was talking, I asked myself, where are the creative minds of other countries uh, who are comparable to those of the past? In other words, uh, I don't think we're the only nation that is uh, relatively sterile, so to speak. Everybody else seems to be this, in the same situation. And is this perhaps something uh, which uh, we ought to give a great deal of thought to, namely that the world is emulating our country at its worst, and that the best minds all over the world are turning to technology and industry at this time in, uh, completely absorbed in the, in, in the better life in the, term, in the material sense, which of course is a terribly important matter from the point of view of, uh, of our own religious traditions, but nevertheless is destructive if it becomes monopolistic. But it seems to me that uh, a, a culture that, that could produce at the same time Picasso and Frank Lloyd Wright ought not to be treated with such pessimism as we have treated it. Uh, I think that we naturally think of the great period, let's say, of the Renaissance or Florentine Italy, but this is pretty extraordinary, and one wouldn't expect that. But we have and do produce great things, and I, I have a feeling somehow that, that uh, we're on the right track. I think perhaps, too, that we're forgetting the creativeness of the creator who remained unknown. The really creative spirit of the past, I think, is to a great extent the unknown man, the anonymous person. Uh, who gave of himself all that he could and really affected the community. And he was the worm of Jacob that the prophet speaks about. And so he didn't write any books. He just was a saint. And if I rattled off the names of the 30 or 40 great men who lived at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, not one of their names would be recognized by 90% of the American Jews, and of course it would not be recognized by 100% of the other Americans. I wouldn't deny what you're saying, but I think that we have gotten, in our elaboration of uh, the idea of creativeness and creativity, uh, to deal too much with the arts and the humanities uh, at the expense of creativeness in building communities. Now, uh, the big communities were not creative in the way that these smaller communities were not only ourselves, but take the difference between the Greeks and the Romans. The Greeks had this great artistic gift and scientific and philosophical gifts, but they didn't have the gifts that the Romans had of building a great imperial community. Let us call that creativeness, too. And so let us, in spite of uh, my pessimism about American culture, say that what is valid in American culture is that we and... Uh, the British before us have had this creativity of building relatively just communities. Maybe one of the things that is coming out of <clears throat> our discussion, at least it's coming to my mind, is that the fundamental question in our country today, maybe it always was, is character education. Let's say, uh, does a person who attends one of our schools for a number of years emerge a better human being in the sense that he would consider his life well spent if he did something creative, though he was a failure in every other respect. I can't believe that the country that is that had a nation has, has known how to change a, a corner grocery store into a supermarket chain and to develop the General Motors Corporation isn't capable of giving education to all its young people on the same level that Oxford and Cambridge did at their best. Now, if it doesn't do it, it's because it doesn't put its mind as effectively to education as it does to the business of general voters. Well, I think that one thing that comes out is that theology, theology is more practical than philosophy. That's it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing, it seems to me, is this, that what we seem to have forgotten is that if we do have the gift or power or capacity of being free, we've got to learn to accept its consequences, and not all of those are very pleasant. And if you're given, as, the, as Genesis says, if you're given dominion over the earth with all of its living things, if you're given this, you've got responsibilities. And it seems to me that if we can make that clear, it's extremely important. You get no rights without duties. 
and you can't solve these problems easily and you can't solve them in theory. But theory it seeps down and it seems to me extremely important that we talk as we do from all of our points of view, from the point of view of the artist and the sculptor and the scientist, the philosopher, the teacher of religion, and in some sense try to get a meeting of minds because we cannot. Uh, we seem to be cursed by freedom at the same time that we're blessed by it. And somehow we've got to learn how to live with it and make it useful. Well, I think there is a general agreement with, uh, in our approach to this, which would be defined like this, the tension between technology and culture and the dangers to culture or technology of a passion for techno technological achievement. And the second is the, uh, the uh, tension between uh, excellence and bigness. And th there we agree. The one point where you still disagree is when Finkelstein uh, uh, suggests that uh, an, a nation which can build supermarkets can do equally well if it just puts its mind to uh, having education for everybody. These are uh, in different order of uh, a different order of achievement, and that's precisely the problem. So I'd say in this point, point we don't agree at all. Well, we haven't time to argue that out. I think among uh, with two, there were three theologians present, uh, a philosophical <laughs> theologian or a theological philosopher, and I said, you know, some balance ought to be struck here because uh, so many of the, uh, the people who are thinking hardest about what's wrong with America take a positivistic point of view. So let me, let me speak from that point of view for a moment, not philosophically, but be positivistic in the sense of being technical about this. It seems to me that you have shown very clearly here, although nobody has specifically said it, Whereas in technology, and perhaps in science, although this is doubtful, but certainly in technology, the inventive and the imaginative mind can exhaust the possibilities of his problem without any sense of value, commitment, uh, general philosophy of the world, or anything else. He doesn't need it. But when you get into any of the greater regions of the imagination or human creativity, the arts, philosophy, religion, anything that evaluates life or judges life, then you've got to have a content of value. And we're making the mistake, and I think this was implied in what Mr. Niebuhr just said. We're making the profound philosophical mistake in our culture of thinking that the same kind of effort, the positivistic effort, if you want to call it that, that succeeds to the limit in technology and goes very far in science, is not sufficient in the fine arts or in the evaluative aspects of life, and therefore those tend to be technically brilliant but empty, uh, they're, they're, they're unsatisfactory, they're inadequate, and the young are unfed because they don't realize that in this aspect of man's life uh, he's got to go after something bigger than himself. Man the Creator, conversation number one in a series exploring the creative process as it pertains to the American artist and scientist in the 20th century. Host for the creative mind, Lyman Bryson. Producer for the series, Jack D. Summerfield, with William Kavnis and Nadja Eisenberg as production associates. Guests for this program, Milton C. Nam, professor of philosophy at Bryn Mawr College, Reinhold Niebuhr of Union Theological Seminary, and Louis Finkelstein of the Jewish Theological Seminary, both in New York. Next week, Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect as creator. The Creative Mind is produced and recorded by WGBH-FM in Boston for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters under a grant from the Educational Television and Radio Center. This program was distributed by the National Educational Radio Network.